Agus Avoch, and uh, welcome to the Shear. I'm going to share with you, first of all, I'd like to share something which is a little bit of a house. Like Agarato, before this, this is, uh, I want to just, whoever was, uh, people are asking about Ere Pesach or Shechol B'Shabbos. So on Monday night, there'll be a Shear, it doesn't say on the notice, but it's a Shear for Neshe Chabad. Uh, on the uh, Inyanim of Erev Pesach Shechol B'Shabbos. So that will be a whole sheet devoted to that topic. And anyone is welcome to uh, to join. You have there the, it's it's not the regular, it's not on my uh, Zoom number. You can see it's a different number. The number will come up again at the end of this year and the, the post will come up again. Okay, so we've discussed some time ago We discussed some time ago about if you are downing in a minion and they say Olenu ahead of you, should you uh, say Olenu with them and a second time? And at the time I shared with you a letter of the Rebbe, which was published nine years ago in Toshin Ein Base. And this is, was the Rebbe's answer is, you should say at the end of davening, as it says in Zarizal, and also you should just say it together with the Tzibur. And both times you should say the whole Aleinu. Now, it, when it was published in the back of a contrast for Chaya Sorat of Shunayim Beis, they, they fortunately had a copy of the question. So I'm going to read the question, the Mikhtav HaShoyal. He says, in the weekdays, I daven in a shul where they daven Ashkenaz, because there's no Chassidah Sheminyan in his place. And he himself does in Nusukhari. I'm not sure what to do about, about Oleinu, because according to what's brought in Achroinim, one should say it B'tzibur, and therefore should I say it before Shil Shalyoim, as in the Sakashkinas, or at the end of Davening, or both times. After Davening, because it's the end of Davening, and also before Shil Shalyoim to say it with the minion. Now this is the part which, which puzzled me. V'daimani she'be'eshel avrohom l'hagon ha'kodesh mi'buchach iso in the Eishel Avrohom of the Butchotcherov, he says you are should be mafsik for Oleinu even in the middle of Sukkot Zimra. But only until Ein Oid. Im Kain, Hashayli Higam Khan. If you're meant to be interrupting in the middle of all, in the middle of Sukkot Zimra to say Aleinu, for sure you should be meant to be interrupting um, before Shesha Yonu say Aleinu. But then he's asking, according to that, should I say Ad Eifoi Le Omre Bepam Harishn? So when so he says something from the Bachachar of saying only half Aleinu, the first part of Aleinu. So when I'm going to interrupt to say Shesha Yonu with the Ashkenaz Minya before Shesha Yonu, should I say the whole Aleinu or the half Aleinu? What bothered me all this time was I couldn't find this word of the Bachacharov because the dinam of Aleinu belong in around Simon Kuflamid Aleph, Kuflamid Bay, somewhere around there. And it, there's no comment there. Now, this week, Rebbe Meir Zirkin, so I think he's in the Western Florida, he sent me this piece where the Bachacharov speaks about this. And I want to describe a little bit who the Bachacharov is. The Bachacharov is a, he was originally not a Chassid, and he was Niskarev by the Bardicheva. The whole story in the back, the, the Bachacharov was a phenomenal goan. The evidence here that is that he's got his notes are printed in the Erechaim. And the back of the Shukhan Aruch, you've got pages and pages of Eishel Avram. In Evan or Ezel, you've got Ezer Mikoidish. That's note at the bottom of the Shukhan Aruch in Evan or Ezel. Those are notes from the Bichot Shirov. Then in, 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 in Yeredeya, you've got Das Kedoshim. You've got Das Kedoshim on Hilchus Shechita and Trefis. And you've got Das Kedoshim on Hilchus Stam. That's, these are very well known for him. He has others for him. He was a Gewaldeke Gorn 
And when he became a chassid, he started dabbling barichas. Now, he would dabble for many hours. Now, I saw, and I couldn't find this now, but I remember reading that he was the Rav in Buchach, and he had a, a, a system. When people would come, even while he was in the middle of davening, he would, he would answer Shail as well as in the middle of davening. But he wouldn't be mafsik. He had a system with his gaboyim to show whether it's kosher, treif, he had a way, a code, how he would answer Shilas even as he was in the middle of davening. As you say, he was davening uh, so uh, he was available even during davening, which I found phenomenal. But I say, I can't find the source for that now, but that might explain a little bit more. He was, his, his style is very humble and he would write down every day. He was, somewhere I saw he would write down like 18 pieces of Chidushim every day. And very often he says, I was this and I had a, th a thought, this fell to my mind, that came to my mind. Like his, he, he writes his own, um, his doubts, etc. So now let's read the piece over here. This is in Simon, this is in Simon Nundalit. So it's talking about Psuki de Zimra. Between Yishtabach and Yoitzer, you're allowed to be mafsik l'tzorich mitzvah. Now, no recommendation here. The Alter Rebbe also brings it about being mafsik l'tzorich mitzvah after Yishtabach, before Yoitzer Eir. But ashoi levorich oz birchas milo rishoyno ushnio. You can make the broches by a bris. So what is he referring to? Brocha rishoyno ushnio. I'm not sure. I don't know whether he, I didn't, when I read, I didn't see that he was a moil. The Mugkacherov was a moil, but the Bachacherov, I didn't hear that he was a moil. It looks like he was given the kibbut of giving the name. So after the bris, the moil says the brocha ala milo, the father says the brocha ala achnisoi. Then after the bris is done, then the, whoever is given the honor would say the brocha be'er piagofen, and then ashakidi shidid mi beten. So he probably is referring to this. And so you're middle of davening, you can, if you are given the honor of, of uh, leading the, the brachas to, to give the naming, so you can do that also. It's all Tzorich Mitzvah. And you can also say to the father, Mazel Tov. V'oleinu, at the bris, it has said that to say, Oleinu. V'oleinu imat sibur, yesh leimag al kolponim ad emes malkeinu. So at least till emes malkeinu. So the Ula Gam Kola no Loima Bemilo Zehakise, Hulu, Vishem Shanichnas, Hulu, Yachaloima, perhaps all the sayings which the people present at the bris join in, you can say between Yishtabach and Yotz. Omikal Mokhaim, this is typical of his style. Yesh Loima, the Dai Behiru Bakar, perhaps you could just be Yotz to have it in thought. And even Mazel Tov, Kim de Emene, Baroche Bemachshabte, since in your mind you want to give the person a Broche, Yachel and Lisbe, Sheomer Belachash. So the person will think you said no, I'm, 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 I'm mazel tov quietly. And therefore, it's not so imperative they have to say a loud mazel tov. So he's grappling whether to say uh, mazel tov to the father by the bris. So my, my, my understanding of the situation is that the, as I said, he was a marich mitzvah and he would but when there was a breeze, so he was a you know the rov in the shul of the community, so he was there, and he would perhaps work it out that he would be pausing between Yishtabach and Yitzer to be able to participate in the bris. And if he's given the broches, he'll say the broches. And he's questioning about to say Mazel Tov. Then he says Oleinu daf mezogin. You should say Oleinu, but not the whole Oleinu. Only till till what was it? What did he say? Um, until him. Um, it was again. Oh, till Emma's volcano. That seems to be what's going on here. What's his topic? Why do we say Oleinu by a bris? The Pashtis, the origin was that they would have the bris in Shul by Shachris, and after Oleinu, after, after, before Oleinu, they would do the bris, and then Oleinu was the last piece. But the poil became in many communities, it's not clear what's the Chabad Minik. But it came, the Altarebbe doesn't bring it in the Siddha, but it became many communities that say that they say Oleinu after a bris, even if the bris is not doing davening. And the idea, one of the things is 
that the Oleinu is a statement. A Yid is going out of Shul, out into the street. And he's saying, It's a declaration, I'm not like Gayarotsis. I'm different. I'm not when I eat in Goy. By the baby, by the breeze, he came in an oral and he goes out as a, uh, in, in Russia, they used to call it Giyidisht. He had the breeze as a Giyidisht. So he's been become a Yid. So they would say, Aleinu is, is now you welcome him into the, into the Bnei Briz. Some say that the reason for saying Aleinu has got to do with the second oil in Bamachos Chi and Dalad Yud. The union of, of the Briz is the union of Tikkun. The baby wasn't born with this, the second oil. That's in the second paragraph. It looks like the Bachotche Erov was of the opinion that the Aleinu, the Ik is the first part of Aleinu. And that's why he was saying, it's been Yishtabach Liyotze. You're allowed to be Mavsik Latech Mitzvah. All right. So until MS Malkainu, what was his words again? Until, until, until MS Malkainu, or so that's that's okay. Afterwards, there's Efshin Nishkat Tzorich Mitzvah. So he, he wasn't. So what I'm seeing here is that the person who wrote to the Rebbe obviously didn't have the Bachotcha Rov's name quote in front of him because uh, he doesn't give an re exact reference. So he's saying from memory, and he and he's writing the Bichotchedov says you can be Mavsik in middle of Sukkot Zimra. It was also a, 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 um, a confusion. He was saying Ben So this seems to be the source of of uh, of this Bichotchedov, which is being quoted in this letter of the Rebbe, or the Rebbe is responding to. I'll call upon him now. We are now I've, I've kind of managed to uh, understand this mystery. Why should you only say the first part of Aleinu? The question was about Bayabris. Bayabris, actually, the first part is relevant to Aleinu, but we're coming back to the Rebbe's immediate question. If you're diving in Ashkenaz Minyan and uh, they are ahead and they are saying Aleinu, so the Rebbe says, by answer saying Aleinu with the Minyan, there's no reason to hesitate about the saying, um, you know, you're in the middle of Shishayim or before Shishayim. So the Rebbe says you should say the whole thing. Okay. Let now let's now um, look at the chats. Just I wanted to share with you this. Uh, I was excited to find this this solution to this uh, mystery, and uh, a little bit of history of who this Bachotcherov was. Uh, he was his, he had a Talmud called the Meiril or Premishlan, and uh, he said uh, Rebbeil is about Ruach Hakodesh. He's a simple fellow. It's, it's like very very beautiful to read about him. Okay, um, someone on the chat is asking, can you say to heal him at that point? If you're waiting for the chasen to say Yishtabach, I've seen some people say Tilma at that point, never seen that in the Bavich. Although we say Shir Hamailis at this point, you're right. We say Aseres Me Tshuva, we say Shir Hamailis Me Mamakim at that point. And to include other things, is, uh, I can see the basis for it. It's a Tzorich Mitzvah, it is a Tzad Heter, but I would hesitate to say so. Someone else is writing here. He davens in a minion factory, Givaldic. Um, and do I have to do interrupt learning in between to join every Oleno that takes place? Very good question. When I was a Bocher, I asked Reb Zalman Shimon. I mean, 770. 770 is a minion of the whole time. And he gave me a little bit of the freedom of the Loshan of the Gemara in Megillah, Anan Bididan with Inhu Bididhu. That you can continue doing your thing and you can ignore what's going on. I still I would say this with a certain reservation. You're, if, if it's glaring that there's a minion saying Kedusha and it's very loud, etc. You're nearby, it's glaring that you are ignoring what's going on. I think that's inappropriate. If you're at the other end of the base medrash, and it's, it could be seen, it can be that you didn't hear, you're not really involved. I think there's a difference whether it's whether it's very boilet, then I think it would be uh, inappropriate to uh, to to ignore it. If it can be seen that you, uh, that, you, that you didn't notice, uh, you do it. You do your own thing. Let's move on to the next question here on the quest on the chat here. Levi Monshine. Lachoyra Masim Mashakosa Beish Lavrom Mashakosa Ein Ad Ein Oid Ein Oid Sheba Emtsa Hachel Karishin. So the Rebbe in his thing, the Rebbe doesn't say where, he just says, says the whole thing. But the other person had asked, till ain't oid, which is also as a mitten. Yeah, I think Al Kaponu, I just see that there was a, a certain 
the person who quoted was quoting from memory and didn't have it mamish accurate. Let's move on to the next question. So this is a question I got from a shliach. He's actually in Brazil. Um, but uh, he asks a question. He, he goes on Mifzat Filin. And one of, the, one of the opportunities to find Yidin, unfortunately, we know that there's this word. I don't know who is the one who said it, that it's the Mesim who, bring, who keep the shuls alive. Uh, when people come to say Kaddish in the shuls, unfortunately, this is one time where people who are totally unaffiliated will still come to a Jewish thing, and that is to a Levaya of a relative, etc. And so we want to have Yidin to put on Tefillin. On the other hand, you're not allowed to put on Tefillin in a cemetery, and he asked for some guidance about this, whether you can put it, the Tefillin in a side room. So let's read here, this is Dinah Shukhan Aruch. Um, the term used here, as you can see the last line, the term Loyeg Lerosh, means to scoff at the pauper. The person who is already passed on from this world is unable to do mitzvahs. So he's a rosh. He's called a pauper. And it's wrong for us to scoff at the pauper to say, ah, oh, I can do mitzvahs, you can't do mitzvahs. That's the basis I'm going to read now the Shukhan Aruch. Lo yahalich beveis hakvoris. You shouldn't walk in a cemetery. Oi besoich arba amas shomes, or within four cubits of a, uh, a corpse, or tefillin berosha wearing tefillin on your head, because of loyach and loyach l'rosh. Vim hemechusim, if it's covered, it's mutter. So reading, it's important to read this quote, because you see here, there's two things. Besoich arba amas and the first thing, Beisak Voris. So the first quote, Beisak Voris, means that even it's not within Arba Amis, the issue of putting wearing tefillin in the presence of a, of a mace in a Beisak Voris encompasses the entire Beisak Voris. The whole Beisak Voris, the whole cemetery, would be included in this issue of, uh, of Loeg Lerosh. However, if there is a Mechitza, then that would be okay. And therefore, if you have, first of all, many cemeteries, and say what we have here in London, that you have a, an area like where the parking, where people park their cars, that's quite separated. And then afterwards, there's a fence. So with the park, car park area, uh, and where there's a fence between there and the graves, you, that would be okay. For that matter, many cemeteries do have some kind of uh, shtibel, uh, chapel, whatever you want to call it, where they do um, the Kelmol uh, etc. et cetera. So that, again, it's, it's not in view of the Kvorim. It's in, the fact that there's a window open is irrelevant. There's a Mechitze in between. And so if there's a Mechitze in between, that would be okay. Okay, let's go on to the next one. And here I had a, a very interesting experience. That someone actually sent me a kasha on this piece of the shear uh, on Friday because I rent, send out my notes on, on, on Thursday night. So on Friday morning, I got a kasha on the shear which I hadn't said yet. But we'll do what we can. Okay, the, sh the question was, what about wearing a gartel? People wear a gartel. Uh, there's no, there's, it's not a mitzvah to wear a gartel. It's a, it's an hoga toivo, and one, one wears a gartel. If you're going over to a cave, you wear a gartel. So now, what happened was the following: a young fellow, a Balchuva, a recent Balchuva, lives in northwest London, which is and it's within the, the Eidav, as I'm saying, we're relying on the Eidav, but there is an Eidav there. And his parents are out. A neighbor, a Goisha neighbor, knocks on the door and he asks, Can you help me? My car, my battery is flat. Could you, uh, do you have a jump start, um, a clips, whatever it may be, uh, or perhaps one of those, uh, you have these now, you have a, a portable with a, with a battery kind of, which, which will start the car. So he's asking the Yiddish boy, this Belchuvri is allowed, can I borrow from you the thing? And so he felt very uncomfortable. The boy, because he, he, it's his parents' home and it's a neighbor. And you want to give the Dakya Sholem with neighbors. And if his parents had been home who are not Shema Shabbos, they for sure would have lent the equipment to this Goisha neighbor. And so he felt, so he, and then the fellow wasn't so sure how to do it. So he was showing him how to do it. And so after Shabbos, he's asking whether uh, he was right or wrong in what he was doing. So, we're talking here the Acha Hamaisa, but it's it's a little Medani Tzorich. So let's look at what the what the issues are. There's two issues. One is about lending a goy something who's going to walk out of your house. And let's say if a goy comes to your house and wants to borrow a chair, It'd be the same question. That's that's one question. The second thing is 
the guy is borrowing from you something which is he's going to do malacha with it so here we have two sources and my apologies in the notes it should be not reish mem hey it's reish mem vav so here we have in simon reish mem vav a discussion about giving a guy something and he's going to walk out even if his mom is before shabbos never mind on shabbos even just before shabbos a guy bought from you something and he wants to walk out of your house with it on Shabbos. So there's a Marasa and people will say, ah, you're selling stuff on Shabbos. So, and even close before Shabbos, there's also a question. So I'm going to now read inside. If the guy is just borrowing something, one would be allowed to, he wants to borrow a chair, for example, especially if there's an Eidav, I think it's sort of when there is an Eidu, which is that is the case here. If it wants to borrow something, but now there's a difference between borrowing and, which we'll see in a moment, a long-term kind of loan, which we'll probably use the term halvar. But if you sold something to a guy, even if you sold it before Shabbos, or if it's a long-term loan, or if you give the guy something for a, a, a pawn, or you gave him something to do malacha with it, then it's imperative that the guy leaves your house before Shabbos. So if he's coming to borrow something, like a borrow a chair, that's okay. But if he's taking something which is actually that he bought it from you, he can't walk out with the bought item from your house on Shabbos. Because the onlooker will find out through the grapevine that this was a sale. Or he'll vow, or it was a, a long term thing, or Mishkin, or it was a pawn, or in a son of Lelasis Ve Melocha, or it was given to the Goy to do work with it, and Kim and Shekane or Amis, because that is the truth. But Yachshide, you should also came by Shabbos. So if it's actually something which is forbidden to do on Shabbos, even though you agreed with the Goy before Shabbos, but the onlooker won't know, he'll think that the sale was it, it carried out on Shabbos. But if, let's say, the borrowing a chair, You'll find out, yeah, he borrowed the chair. You're allowed to lend a chair to a, to a neighbor on Shabbos. So, so, go, so, fine. so here we have a difference between um, Shailo and... So on this level, if a guy comes to you on Shabbos and there's an Eidu and he wants to borrow a chair, there's no problem to lend him, and lend, lend him a chair. The question here is, Lasus be Melach. You're lending him something to do Melach. And that now brings us into the second, second quote, which is from now from Simon Shein Zayn, where it says, Shein Zayn is one of the few places, one of the several places, where the dinim of Amira Lenochri are discussed. They are scattered in different places. Um, there's actually a sefer published by Rebero Levins, or Zangizun, published about four or five years ago, all about Amir al We collated all the material from all the different places and put them into one sefer. At any rate, so the Dean of Osur is Loy Osur Amir al El Elas is Bishvil Yisrael. To ask a goy, to tell a goy to do something is only if he's doing it for me. You're allowed to tell a goy to do something for himself, for himself, or for another goy. Even if he, you also will benefit from it. So, for example, the villages of old, a fire started in, a, in the property of a goy. You've got a fire in your property, put out your fire. The Kavanosa, and your intention is also a bit self uh, uh, motivated. You don't want the fire to hop from his place to your place. That's okay. So, you're allowed to tell a goy to do malacha. For him, for himself. Even if the goy is doing malocha, he's taking your spade and digging his garden. 
You don't have to, okay, if you see him doing with your, with your tools, you are allowed to ignore it. You mustn't give the guy a piece of equipment and say, here, take this and do malocha. Even if you have to give it, give it to him. So, for example, you give him a piece of meat, take this piece of meat, cook for yourself lunch. You give him a piece of meat, cook yourself for yourself lunch. Even if it's not your responsibility, not your uh, you know, live in, or whatever, it's an independent guy to give him. I don't get anything, he'll cook lunch. I'm, he's taking my meat and I'm giving you a piece of meat and I'm going to be have one piece of meat less. I'm still you mustn't you mustn't give him the tools to do melacha. So when you're giving him a piece of meat or you're giving him, you say, take this spade and, 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 and do your gardening, whatever. So then it looks like Here's your shliach, even though the intention is that the guy is doing it for himself. So this is where we have come back to this jump start equipment. Uh, my, my, I'm still inclined that that in in this instance, where he's clearly going to jump start his own car, I'm more inclined to say that there's no marisa ayin that is doing it anything for you. If you give him something, a piece of meat, and it may be for you, maybe for for him, it may, maybe uh, he's working for you. I don't know. I, I, my 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 um, my inclination is to say that that here it's different. Uh, it's it's clearly uh, it's any any onlooker will see that this is that the guy is doing it for himself. But okay, this is where the person who challenged me on Friday he sent me a piece of the Kafa Chaim on Simon Shin a Sin Reish Memvav. And he says like this, talking about lending a guy a piece of furniture, we said that's okay. But if uh, the guy is, it's like a, a plowshare, then that, would, that wouldn't be, uh, I think he talks about it. The impression, the Taz says, you shouldn't give him a plowshare, which is going to go out, be out of the tchum. But what about a, a tool to do work within the tchum? It seems to be okay. But then he says, but from the Taz is mashma, no, that you cannot lend tools uh, um, which they will do malocha with them. You can only lend things which are not malocha stuff, like a shirt, and like a talus. So the, uh, the, uh, the Kafachayim is saying that to give a goy a tool with which he will do malocha would not be allowed. And that comes back to what we said. It looks like you are appointing him as a shliach. You're telling him to do something. And it may be seen by someone, uh, the onlooker is doing it for you. And I still say, in any case, we're talking about here, the story has happened already. Um, I'm inclined to say that, again, here it's not evident. If I can, anyone who sees a guy borrowing a jump start from you sees that they're doing it clearly for themselves, not for you. But you can't Okay. Um, let's go on to another question. Reb Zalman is asking, Kalim are not chai b'shvul. So clearly, it's machlokes uh, b'shamber b'shilol, and we pass him. There's no din of shvisas kalim, like b'shilol. Okay. Now, someone asked me this question at the beginning of the week about bathing on on Yom Tiv. We're going to have here a Shabbos and two days Yom Tiv, and. Uh, Feel a little bit uncomfortable about because uh, the men go to mikveh, and therefore they have already uh, stickle relief. People don't use mikvehs, so then it means three days without bathing at all can be very, very uncomfortable. So what's the issue here? So here, what's the issue about yom tov of, of bathing on yom tov? So first of all, I want to um, clarify this. In, in our houses, we've got boilers. There's two forms of boiler. There's one which is what's uh, got a, a hot water tank. And as you take out water from the hot water tap, then 
cold water fills in, pours in the equivalent amount into the hot water tank, and then the temperature, the thermostat will sense, and then they'll switch on later. That is, has got a certain flexibility for use on Yom Tov. There's another type, which I don't know what's cheaper to run, but that's the one which I have when I moved into the house. Uh, we don't have a hot water tank. We have what's called a combi boiler. And as you open the tap, the flames go on, like the old Ascots, we think they used to call them geezers also a long time ago. And that provides heating, it provides hot water. That's for sure, there's no way you can use on Yom Tov. You turn it on, the fires go on, you turn it off, the fires go off. Plus you are activating a pump. There's no way you can use the hot water from such a system on Yom Tov. So, so now let's have a dignity spoken about the boilers. Let's just take a look about bathing. So now we have here from the Alter Rebbe Shikhanaro here in Simon Hilchus Yom Tov. Kvan is boil. Kvan is boil with Simon Tov Tzadikhe. The Metoich. Shehutro. Sorry. The Metoich Shehutro. This. This thing, I don't know how to get this out of the way. Um, like you're allowed to make a fire for cooking, for making food. So you are allowed to make a fire for not mamish eating. For example, to light a fire in the fireplace. Um, by the fireplace to warm up a bit. And you are allowed to warm up a bit of water, a little bit of water, to wash your hands, your face, and your feet. You're allowed to do the warm up water for that. You're not allowed to warm up water to bathe your whole body. Now, as you know, on Shabbos, we're not allowed to bathe in hot water. And that's because of the Xeris Merchatsois, that are born saw that the bath attendants were warming up water in a forbidden way on Shabbos. And therefore they said, you're not allowed to bathe on Shabbos. It would have been Givaldic, you know, got a day off. It would have been a perfect time to have a nice hot bath. Chacham saw it was, it was leading to problems and they forbade Isra Merchatsois. That also applies on Yom Tov. The Fichoch Ach Af Medivrem, this is just pieces from the um, beginning of Tovkof Yud Aleph. Um, you would be allowed to, he says here, according to the first opinion, you'd be allowed to bathe your body with water heated from Erev Yom Tov. And But if it's within the Merchitz, you're not allowed to wash your body. Only, um, uh, then he says, Only, he says, to bathe your whole body in one go, even if the water was heated before Yom Tov, is not allowed. So this is, to have a, to have a full bath on Yom Tov is not allowed. Why? Because of Xeris Mechatsois, because, because it was seen as, um, a, a, to, it was seen as Eine Shovel Chol Nefesh, to have to bathe every day, and therefore it becomes an Osir, uh, to do it on Yom Tov, and therefore you're not allowed to bathe it, because you, you, you shouldn't come to heat up the water. And then we just finish off, it's just bits and pieces. The Kimish Yeshbos is a Shel Torah, less, less, according to second opinions, is a Shel Torah, to heat up water for bathing. Therefore, you're not allowed to bathe your whole body. So you're not allowed to bathe your whole body even with water which was heated before Yom Tov. So what does remain? What does remain is to wash, part, not the whole body, but parts of the body with water which was heated beheter, then you would be allowed to. So therefore the answer to this question is, is it a permissible way to bathe parts of one's body? Obviously not with a washcloth, not with a flannel, whatever you call it, because there's an issue of schita, but to just to put have warm water on your hands, take, whether you take it from the urn and if you, or you have one of those um, hot water systems with a, with a hot water tank, you would be allowed to take water out of that on Yom Tov. To take a bit of it in a, in a bowl and to wash the parts of your body which you're feeling very uncom uncomfortable with, that, that would be allowed on Yom Tov. Um, someone's asked me to turn on the volume, turn up my volume. I, 
can't do that. I don't have the facility to do that. I've, I've just raised the camera, the mic close to my mouth. Someone's asking, can a goy turn on the water of a combi boiler on Yom Tov? Can a goy warm up the mikveh on Yom Tov? Very good questions. Um, uh, to, to turn on the water of the combi boiler probably would be okay. Um, uh, on Yom Tov, I think that would be okay. But um, let, let's leave that for another time because it's a... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that the Ebrister did not give me a responsibility uh, of the day-to-day -day running of a mikveh because there are a lot of shilas in running the mikvehs. I don't know whether you're talking about a men's mikveh or not. But yeah, you're asking what is the Issa Shalter? Of course, you can look up inside in Tovko Fyut Aleph. The shaila is if you say, if you say that it's not Shovel Chol Nefesh, like for example, about smoking cigarettes, smoking cigarettes on Yom Tov, so the, the already the Stechemed, who lived uh, more than 100 years ago, says it's fire is not Shovel Chol Nefesh. Not everyone appreciates the, um, the, the smoke of tobacco. And therefore, there are poskim who say you're not allowed to smoke cigarettes on Shabbos. I'm oh, sorry, on, on Yom Tov. On Shabbos, for sure not. Yeah, everyone agrees. Um, but on Yom Tov, because it's not Shavu Lechol Nefesh. In those times, in the Zman Chazal, having mm -hmm. a hot bath on a daily basis was not, was not Shavu Lechol Nefesh. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, thing, a standard thing. And on that basis, that's what he's saying is Isra Taira. I'll just tell you some, a similar thing. What's the issue of, of medicine? Why can't you take medicine on, on Yom Tov? Yom Tov Shani, you can, but Yom Tov Rishi, you're not allowed to. It's, 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 uh, you're eating it because medicine is not Shavu Lechol Nefesh. So if I would make a medicine on, on Yom Tov, I wouldn't be allowed to because it's, 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 it's a kind of food. It's in a Shavu Lechol Nefesh. Um, all right, let's move on. Can you wash your body, but one limit? Not, there should be just try to keep it just the, uh, the per, Parts which are most bothering. Uh, not, I don't think you should do the whole body. Um, with cold water, okay. Um, yeah, in, in, there can be parts, climates where you chalash even for a cold shower. Bichlal, um, the minhag to, is not to have a cold shower on Shabbos. It's on the level of minhag. And same, similar on Yom Tov. But Lutzerich Godlman would be mekel to have a cold shower. That's written in Shemir Shabbos Kilchos. So let's say in Eretz Yisrael, three days in Shavuos. No, they don't have three days, two days, yeah? But if you have, and you're really very uncomfortable, so that would be okay with cold water. Okay, someone again, let's move on. Um, I heard once something about showering with a kitchen utensil. Okay, I don't know about that. Um, a little water in a bath and just sit in this. So... Yeah, if it's if it's not the whole body, just a part of the body, and to put a bit of cold, um, warm water, let's say, from either from the urn or from if you have a hot water tank, and put it in a bowl and and uh, relieve the discomfort, that would be okay. On Yom Tov. Yeah, today things have changed, but uh, we need to have a Sanhedrin kind of to undo the Isurim, which I was saying. Okay, someone is saying, um, Shevet Levi says that smoking is mazik. Therefore, also on Yom Tov. Okay, yeah. Um, let's not make it, um, you know, widen the battlefront against smoking. Baruch Hashem has become quite unpopular. But you have this settle from the Freydi Karebe that those who smoke on Yom Tov on Rosh Hashanah should not smoke at Kolpon in Barabim. So you see already then they were sensitive that there is a chashash of smoking on Yom Tov. And at least Rosh Hashanah, when it should be more mahader. So, yeah, Baruch Hashem, things have, have improved in this respect, and people are, uh, are uh, but for the people who are addicted to smoking, to tell them they mustn't smoke in Yom Tov, it's, uh, it's a difficult one, yeah. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I don't have a personal problem. Um, taking medicine Yom Tov permitted, if not doing so, of course, if you, very important, uh, if you are uh, dependent on medicine, you should, uh, don't stop medicines without asking a shayla, and uh, if it's a kind of medicine which you can sip, skip for a day, then you don't take it on Yom Tov Edition, just take it on Yom Tov Shani. Right. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll move on. Um, when we talk about hot water here, someone's asking about Yatsuledes. When you have a shower, it's never Yatsuledes, but you would be jumping out of the shower. It never yet so let us be. It's it's it, and when we're talking about warm warm water, we mean warm that you enjoy the warmth, and so it could be um, 
So that they doesn't have to. Be, we're not talking dafka about very hot. Even warm would also be included in the isamech so Let's move on. Um, let's move on about yom tov. Now, someone, I'm, I'm running about a bit out of time, so let's a little bit faster. Um, someone asked me a question that they trim their nails and very particular about burning the nails. As we know, soy von chosit, and but they don't have their facility to make a fire right away, so they are putting the nails late away and they burn them once in a few weeks. And so I, uh, I, my, my response was and that, that actually, I, I, I remember reading that the Rebbe was makal to to just flush their nails and not not burn them, although it says sofa chosid. I don't have the sefer. There's a sefer called Bakodish Panima. I think I read it over there. But what I'm saying is the reason why we burn the nails is so that they shouldn't be left lying around, so the isha ubro should get in could get into danger. So now, if you're going to save your nails for another few weeks until until you have an opportunity, it seems to be. I know it's not in the place where it was dropped; it's somewhere else. But there seems to be a, a, an in, interest to get rid of them as soon as you can. And therefore, to say, I'm going to save my nails in order to burn them rather than flush them, I think is, is, you know, is, is um, not really the right decision. And especially, as I'm telling you, I, I, I heard that the Rebbe was, was Mekel in this, even though we have the Sofer and Chosid, and it's brought in, in the Sikhs, uh, Sofer and Chosid. But uh, yeah, let's move on. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to do a little bit faster. Placing Chomets in a communal bin. So here you have the Maramokim is in Mem Hay. So, so unmuted. Yeah. So the communal bin is not, let's say you live in a block of flats. So to put your Chomets, let's say your collection day is going to be on Wednesday, Thursday. After the collection, to put your chametz in the communal bin in the block of flats. That's not good enough because to put a hefker, it has to be a hefker la coil, that anyone could come there and no one will tell them what, you, what you're snooping around here for. If it's in a communal bin within a block of flats, it's not hefker la coil. And therefore that wouldn't be enough. You'd have to put, you want to make it hefker, it'd have to be put out in a place where there's no privacy at all. It could be someone in the, in the street or someone like that. Let's move on. Um, all right. My anical last week was complaining I didn't have enough pictures. So here, this is for the anical. Here's a picture. Um, someone asked me about, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, suet cake. And what that is, I, I'm learning new things. There's a kind of, uh, this is to put together for feeding, if you like birds, to come to your garden. So you have a kind of um, um, mass where it's made with seeds and with, um, with fat. That's the way it's called sweat, a seed, and sometimes it's made with grain. And can I have one in my garden of a Pesach? So again, even though you put it out in your garden, it's not hefkela coil. Even if it's in your front garden, certainly your back garden is not hefkela coil. Even if you put it out for the hefke birds, but it's still it's still in private property, in uh, and therefore that's not good enough. And therefore. Um, you wouldn't be allowed to, if it's got grain, and I look, a lot of them do have grain in those suet cakes, so you wouldn't be allowed to have them uh, in your garden. You have to put them away in the Pakev to Chomets. Someone, uh, someone asked me about leaving out uh, my, my mouse uh, poison. Hamachuna uh, in English is called the Last Supper. Um, so um, to put out um, before, and it's usually it's made with grain, that is okay. It's, it's, it's impossible to say you are allowed to leave it out on Pesach because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not a, a Michael which they would survive with, yeah? So it's okay to leave it in place. Let's move on. Um, someone was asking about, they've got pet chickens. What should they do? And their chickens feed on grain. So what should we do for Pesach? So in, in the Shtaris, I, 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 they do include selling animals which feed on chametz. And so the simplest solution would be you have a neighbor and you're giving the neighbor the chickens and, and the feed and, and the, the whole thing, it belongs to the goy over Pesach. Someone asked me about an aquarium. Perhaps I mentioned it before. And I had said that you should um, buy one of those capsules or whatever they call tablets for people go on holiday and leave them to, to feed on it for the two weeks and sell the whole aquarium with the uh, with the tablet in it. 
Now I see now though, my apologies, I now see that the, the uh, Nite Gavriel and others also I saw are not so keen. They say the dog in Bakvarium, you shouldn't give them chomets, even if you sold it for a goy, to a goy, even if it has a, an automatic dispenser, you should put the Yosimu boy macholim, you should feed them stuff which is not chomets. So the problem is you have it in your house, you've got this aquarium and it's got chomets stuff. I, I don't know, I mean, I haven't checked whether the this these tablets are actually chomets, but there is a certain, I'm seeing here, let's say, or well, same thing, you had a, a bird cage. And you want to sell the sell the bird, the budgie with the with the chomets to a goy, and it's going to be in your house chirping away and feeding on chomets. That wouldn't be so so okay. And um, so feed them over over pesach, feed them um, feed them kosher, you know, kosher pesach stuff. And I mentioned, I think last week, you can feed them kidneys as long as they're not Ashkenazim by uh, tradition. Your budgie is allowed to eat. Um, is allowed to eat kidneys on Pesach, especially if it's a kitten, also you can give them kidneys. Okay, um, someone is asking here, I mean, let's go back to the, to the note, to the things. Um, the bins belong to the city is Hefke Lakhel, that's not a problem. You know, can, any, anyone can go there, you can, if someone goes there, you won't, you have no business to tell them not to krich there. So then it's Hefke Lakhel, that would be okay. Um, do you have to check the garden for any bits that have fallen down? Um, not, you don't have to go around with a magnifying glass or not with a candle. You go look around overall, that's okay. Uh, thank you, Suet, thank you. And, um, okay, plankton, okay. Right, you can buy some, I'm told that you can buy freeze-dried um, food, which is not chomets for fish. You mean it's not, it's not chomets and you feed it, buy it for the fish. Okay, good. And someone else tells me he puts his in a fish tank gives it to the neighbor for the eight days of Pesach, Baruch Hashem, you know, that's why we have um, we've got Goyim who are uh, neighbors who are able to help us with these things. Okay, let's move on. Um, someone is asking about, um, can you give matzah to an unjew? So, Bapashtas, I thought it would be okay. I didn't see any problem. But here you have a Taz, and Simukuf Samach Zayin, and he talks about giving the piece of Hamoitzi to Eine Ben Bris, and he gives a reference, Vaniro Isi from the time of from Recanati. There's a town in, in Italy called Recanati, a small town, and there was a um, Kubel there. Um, and in his Sefer, which is known as Time of Mitzvah of Recanati, he says that you should not give Matzah of Mitzvah to a Sheine Ben Bris. And he gives Tam Hogan Lozer. Now, this is the Taz. And now, on the left side of the column of the, of the uh, slide, you see here the actual quote from the Target Time of Mitzvah, which was published here in London by the late, late Reb Simcha Lieberman uh, about 40, 50 years ago. And it, I'm, I'm looking at it, and it looks like he's talking about the Korban Pesach rather than talking about the Matzah. Um, there you can see here, but also lahachil mimenu, he's talking here about the Korban Pesach, but also lahachil mimenu l'necha v'toshav v'sochir. So he doesn't seem to be talking about, um, uh, about the uh, about the matzah, but the Taz understood is referring to matzah, so the matzah shall mitzvah. So again, I'm not so sure whether that applies to all the matzahs which you have, which you supply for the whole of Pesach, is that all called matzahs le mitzvah, or is it only the ones which are specifically baked for the Seder Nacht? Al-Kaponim, it's in al pisoid that there is seems to be some hesitation about giving matzahs uh, shall mitzvah to a goy, a similar thing there is in, in, in some Sforim and Teshach al about inviting a goy to the sukkah. He's not, no, he's not so happy about it. And again, uh, many paper people were, are, are makele to bring a goy into the sukkah. Okay, um, let's move on. Um, changing clocks from GMT to BST. So the, I think the simplest thing would be if you have a clock which you can change, you set it for BST uh, out, of, uh, out of Shabbos. But I mentioned to the people who make these calendars, uh, including our shul calendar, that a lot of us have um, um, radio controlled clocks and therefore it should have also um, in the calendars will have GMT, especially all of these manim. So I, I think it's, it's, I think it would be simpler that everything, we try to switch to BST and so therefore at least the two days of Yom Tov is going to be clear. And uh, on Shabbos just have to keep, keep track which, which clock you're keeping according to. Now, someone asked me about using mushrooms on Pesach. Now, Chal Chabad custom, it's not only Chabad, it's the Chsidish custom, not to use food on the, unless they can be peeled. So what about mushrooms? Now, mushrooms, as we all know, as we learned it when we were in Shania's Baruchas, that mushrooms are shahakal, they don't actually grow from the ground. 
On the other hand, they are like fungus, which does need to have some kind of uh, moisture, etc. And the it's very common. You can read, I read this in Rabbi Blumenkrantz's guide. Very common that mushrooms are cultivated on a bed of malt or a bed of grain, and therefore they are mamish, a kind of byproduct of grain, and therefore mushrooms should not be used on Pesach altogether. Um, that's what Rabbi Blumenkrantz writes, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. Let's move on. Someone's asking me about um, using the inner leaves of a head of lettuce. According to this minig of, of, of peeling, what about the inner leaves of a lettuce? And um, thank you, Rabbi Menachem Karakanati, thank you. Uh, what about the inner leaves? So my response to this lady was that actually even a cabbage, which is much more closed than a, than a lettuce, we also don't use cabbage on Pesach for the same reason, that because we can't peel them. If you go out to a field, you'll see the cabbage earlier on is open, and then as it becomes more mature, then it's, it, it stiffens and it, it closes in, etc. A kolponim, we're not knowing to use. We're knowing not to use uh, cabbage. Lettuce, of course, you need to use it for the seder. Um, so that there's, you know, we have our priorities. If it's needed for the seder, we use lettuce. And uh, some people, the leftovers for the seder, they'll use during the week. But stamas, it doesn't mean it's a hetta for the whole of Pesach because you have it for the seder. Okay. Um, as I said last time, it's not a perfect science, this Khumra stuff. We manage, we do what we have to do, and we'll be all right. Um, someone's asking, does the Goy have to make a Kenyan on the animal that one's giving them? Yes, they would have to do a Kenyan. And how would it be? Uh, be a question. But if they are, if they are um, going to be Koina, let's say there's a chicken coop, and they are Koina that, so you can do metal to nagav karka that for the coin of the chicken coop, then they then the chickens go as part of the package, or the pass of the lot. Right. Someone's suggesting to keep the old clock. They say it begins earlier. Well, okay, each one to their own. Right. Um, someone's saying the iceberg lettuce are tight from the start, but as I say, even cabbages we we mach me about that. Now, all right, let's go on. Um, having wine. So last week I think we discussed about what foods you can have on Erev Pesach. You can have potatoes, you can have, even though it's on the carapace, you can have eggs, even though it's on the kaira, it's not a problem. It's only the matzah and the morer and the chabad chumre is the ingredients of the charoises, which is a mitzvah. But the other stuff on the kaira you can have. So someone, a lot of, a few people ask me, what about wine? So let's read this. If from Simon Tofain Alev, Nealta Rebbe Shukhanoruch, he talks here about on Ere Pesach not having a pass, even matzah shiro, uh, from in the last quarter of the day, Mishoshoa Sidis. As in that's in order that your eating of matzah should be with a te oven. So having a, a geschmack, having an appetite, adds to the hidr mitzvah of eating matzah. And the last quarter of the day is, if it's a long day, a short day, it's irrelevant, it, it makes all the same thing, that's what we call shosmanio, it's the last quarter of the day, one should refrain from having any form of pass, which is irrelevant to us because we don't have part matzah shir in any case. Then, in the, towards the end of that sif, he says, also the last quarter of the day, you're allowed to have liquids, but not wine. He says, don't eat, drink a little bit of wine, because a little bit of wine is satiating, similar to bread. A lot of wine is going to, going to entice your appetite. A lot of, uh, loads of wine is going to um, disrupt your appetite. So, um, so the basic answer is, the last quarter of the day, let's just keep off wine, keep off grape juice also for the last quarter of the day because of uh, it might have an effect on your appetite. We generally take the view on people who use grape juice for kiddush, etc. So in this sense, when one consider it like wine, it might affect your appetite. So keep off that for the last quarter of the day. Um, Shliach asked a question, the next thing that we have on our list, is asking about having there's a Seder night on Motzah Shabbos and Baruch Hashem it looks like in a part of the world where they're post lockdown, so they're having guests and they're having many guests and to set up the tables uh, is take take time. Can you have Goisha staff to set up the tables on Shabbos afternoon so they're able to start the Seder at night? So the source for the problem is in you see here in Ramo in the dinim of of Shmini Atzeres Simchas Torah. And so the Ramos says, 
on the first day on Shmini Atzeres, you're not allowed to prepare the Kiddush for Simchas Torah night. You're not allowed to prepare on Yom Rishon for Yom Sheni, and certainly not allowed to prepare from Shabbos for Yom Tev. You're not allowed to prepare from one Kedusha for another Kedusha. So you wouldn't be allowed to prepare from one to the other. This is all yourself you wouldn't be allowed to. Then, however, if you have a Goisha waiter, and I, I tell people who are, are catering for large amount of, you know, large crowds, don't do all yourself. Have, have, have help, hire help. So you have a Goisha worker. So this is from the Sefer Piske Chuvas. With a uh, Goisha worker, you're allowed to prepare from one day of Yom Tov to the other. If it's dealing with Tircha, things, effort, schlepping, as I setting the tables, that would be okay. So warm up food now. Warming up food from the asking a goy to put up food, to put up a soup or to put up a rice or whatever. No, no, rice is irrelevant on Pesach. Yeah, sorry. Um, but to put up food on, on Shabbos afternoon that should be heated up in time for the Seder, that's not okay. But to have them just set the tables and do other kind of prep, which is, doesn't involve Malocha, just Tircha, just Aninyan of Hachona, asking a goy would be, to, be okay. Now, I want to go, a preface, and, 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 well, a preface, and, end off with a, 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 a um, Bavarnish. The Alter Rebbe in, in, in Kuntus Achron says, Shvus de Shvus, Amir de Nochri, Shvus de Shvus is only a Bedievet. So, therefore, if you have a space for the Seder, which you could set the room, set up the tables before Shabbos, you'd have to do so. It's only this heter of asking a guy to set the tables on Shabbos afternoon to have it ready for the night is only in the, fa- in, the, in, the, in, the in the circumstances that you don't have. Uh, ability to prepare it before Shabbos, then it's like a B'Sha'as Chak, it's like a B'Di'evet, but it's clearly this, of uh, having a Goy doing stuff for you is clearly a B'Sha'as Chak and B'Di'evet, and certainly in a, in, a, in a family setting, in a smaller setting, you don't do any of this kind of stuff, even if you do have the luxury of having a Goyish worker, and you just, it'll take another couple of minutes to set the table. What I would say is though, one Hachona you do out of Pesach, let me encourage you, is sort out those matzis that the avoiders have you between the whole matzis and the uh, and the broken matzis can be done you know uh, out of out of shabbos and like this it will minimize the uh, the delay in starting the seder as soon as possible finally we have here what about having apple juice very good question is, is there any issue of having apple juice I think it's not a problem because we're talking about the minhag of not having the ingredients of charosis. Apple juice is a little bit removed from that. And so I think it would be okay to have apple juice on the first day um, or the second day, on your first day, right. Um, someone's asking, mushrooms does it make a difference before Pesach or on Pesach? No difference. If the mushrooms are, are nourished from grain, then they've got, they've got a kind of a, um, a presence of comets in them. Therefore, you shouldn't use them. Um, so I was asking, is a chiv to buy full containers, the hechsher and paper or bichlal? Um, if you can, you know, we spend so much on Pesach. Um, so if it's couple, another couple of bob for a hechsher on, on, on a silver foil, uh, these things, they, they do have uh, some kind of, uh, when they have the machine, which the, with the form to make them, they have to have a, some kind of grease. So it would be, a, a, if it's no big deal, one should be machmir to buy with a hechsher. Let's go to our last question. I know we're running out of time. And that is, um, do we have an issue of selling real chametz? Now, the Polish uh, Oilem, which uh, our neighbors, they broadly do not sell chametz mamish. They're only selling uh, kalim, so perhaps, or not even kalim, also not because of the Tevilas kalim. Um, but uh, in Chabad, we, we don't hesitate. We have here a quote. This is from the Oitzim um, in Chabad. In his elder years, in his um, they would sell challah in chametz. So he should have something for to eat, not to shat, not to They had a challah which was you know, eight days old, and um, but they did, they did sell chametz mamish, and the Rebbe Rashab also had chametz um, in, included in the sale of chametz. And just to explain, the there is a view. Why do the why do they hesitate? Because there's a view that Mechiyos Chomets is just a haram, it's just a bit of a sham, it's just a charade of some, of some sort. And therefore, there is that, that uh, how do you say, apprehension to rely on it. 
for the either, either shopkeepers where they're buying after Pesach, so that's the shopkeepers uh, thing. But for themselves, they uh, allow themselves the hidur and then they have uh, you know buy stuff only which is baked out baked after Pesach. Fine, you, everyone to their own. But Chabad uh, are following the Alter Rebbe, and the Alter Rebbe incorporated a, 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 uh, an improvement to the Mechiras Chometz that it includes the uh, support of what's called the Orv Kabbal and the guarantor. And as a result, we see the Mechiras Chometz as authentic rather than just as a sham. That may be the background. But the point is that we don't build up stocks of Chometz before Pesach. By the time it comes Pesach, we don't have much Chometz in the house. But if there is, we don't start throwing it out, don't get frantic about it. And if you do have Chometz, we would not hesitate to sell it in the Mechira as normal. Um, Right. Is there, a, is there a sheer next month of Shabbos? And the answer is, Be'ezus Hashem, yes. Um, the bigger shaila is what we're going to do um, once the clock changes. But um, we'll, we'll deal with that. And we'll have to consider about Erev, you know, Erev Shabbos, um, as we did in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the summer. And meanwhile, just to, again, if you didn't take the number before, this is a sheer it doesn't say, but this is a Shia for Nesheikh Abad, and it's going to be on Monday night, and we'll be able to then go through the uh, details of Erev Pesach Shechol B'Shabbos, and, um, and we'll go through a schedule, and Be'ez Hashem, we'll be able to work through it in a Masuda Dikha way. I wish you all, meanwhile, a guten, a guten Vor, a guten Chodesh, on Nishva Gessen Denossi, and uh, we're now into Chodesh HaGeula, we should be Zorcha to the Geula Shleimo and Mashiach Tzedkeinu, Amen. Good